Awesome. Perfect. I've been reading through everyone's conversations. Thanks to those. Well, thanks to everyone for joining in, but I'm just thinking about how out West, how, uh, how early it is out there. So thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this should only take probably about half an hour or so, so I won't take up too much of your time. Uh, I just want to let you know there is a poll posted, which I believe uh, you can access from just above the chat. There's a tab that says polls. Uh, just asking you what your affiliation is with the CAF community. And then at the end of the session, I'm going to post two more poll questions if you wouldn't mind answering those as well. That would be wonderful. Petawawa, wonderful. So we're from all over the place. So we have 34 attendees right now. We had quite a few more uh, register, but understanding uh, how early it is in some parts of, uh, of our country, we might not get everyone on. But this will be recorded. Uh, so you can rewatch it or, or share it uh, with anyone that you know who might be interested as well. So yeah, so let's get started. I know uh, some people have already started sharing where they're from. So we have Petawawa, Cold Lake. Uh, we have some East Coasters like myself. I'm coming from Halifax. Well, St. Margaret's Bay area is where I live. Um, Kingston. Wonderful. So we're all over the place. Anyone here from BC? Just thinking about how early it is there. Michael. Kimberly, awesome, wonderful. Thanks again so much everyone for tuning in uh, on a Friday morning before a long weekend. Um, so we'll get started with the content. That poll will remain open if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to answer that yet. Um, and yeah, we'll get started. I'm gonna put the, oh, why can't we choose more than one of the options? That's a great question. Um, I will, um, that, there must be a setting or something on Demio that allows us to do more than one option, so I'll look into that for next time. But thanks so much for, for pointing that out. I'll make note of that. Perfect. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna put my um, camera away just for the presentation, just so that the presentation itself can be larger on the screen. If you have any questions, I can see the chat uh, during the presentation, so I'll quickly glance over to see if there's anything uh, that I can answer that might be relevant at the time when we're talking about it. Uh, so yeah, so let's get started here. So uh, this morning we're going to talk about food and mood. Um, so mostly we'll touch uh, on the nutrition that's related to um, your mood and what helps with the receptors and the neurotransmitters and what makes us that like happy and feel good and, and all that great stuff. And then we'll touch a bit about emotional eating. Uh, not too much about that because uh, there's other sessions that uh, are pre-recorded and upcoming that speaks more in depth to emotional eating and more in depth to intuitive eating. Uh, this is more so to make sure that you have a balanced diet um, that increases your mood, decreases uh, and uh, prevents um, depression, all this kind of stuff. This is all um, recent literature and research that's been ongoing. There's a lot of research projects on the go right now um, relevant to the impact of what you eat and how you feel. So this is just a little bit of a touch on that. Uh, so my name is Victoria Stead. I'm a health promotion specialist and registered dietitian uh, for CFB Halifax. And I have been with uh, in this role since July of last year. Uh, so coming up uh, just about on a year here now. Uh, we're involved in, in quite a few uh, different projects here on the East Coast. Um, this is a great one that's ongoing since uh, the pandemic began. Uh, we offer, here in Halifax at least, we offer webinars um, twice a week, usually on Wednesdays and Fridays, you can tune into ours. Uh, also, if you want to follow the PSP Halifax Facebook page, we have some really great resources on there as well. And we also offer on Saturday afternoons uh, cooking classes. So tomorrow you can tune in at 3.30 Atlantic time. And I'm going to be going through um, making a homemade margarita pizza, which might be Great if you have really beautiful weather coming for the Victoria Day long weekend. So that's just kind of a, 
a bit of information about Halifax and, and what we've been doing here. So before we get started, I just have a bit of information that I have to go through. So uh, the presentation you're about to view is the intellectual property of the Department of National Defense. Any reproduction or retransmission of the slides contained in this presentation is strictly forbidden. Some of the topics discussed in this webinar may be of sensitive nature and not appropriate for children, so we ask for parental discretion. Uh, please understand that people's stories are theirs alone to tell, and anything that is shared by participants in this webinar either on camera or in the chat, is not to be discussed outside of the webinar. And finally, this webinar is being recorded, like I mentioned, and will be available for viewing later on on calfconnection.ca. Uh, so I, you can actively participate uh, in the chat if you'd like, or you can just simply follow along without using the chat functions if you prefer. So nutrition and mental health. So we'll touch briefly uh, on this as we get started here. So um, for those of you, uh, the definition really of mental health is that there's no health without mental health. So mental health is not simply the absence of a mental health condition um, like depression or anxiety. Uh, it's more of a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential you can cope with the normal stresses of life, things that get thrown at you. Uh, you can work productively and fruitfully, and you're able to make a contribution to your community. So in the recent years, uh, like I talked about, there's been uh, more research on the role of nutrition in prevention and treatment of depression and other related disorders. So nutrition now is being shown to reduce the risk of depressive symptoms or clinical depression. So really great research coming out about this. So there's, of course, certain nutrients that have been linked to depression risks, and we're going to go through some of these uh, here in a minute. So nutrition interventions such as healthy eating education, like we're talking about here today, uh, food skills training, like cooking classes, um, whether they're virtual or in person, are, are a great way um, for nutrition intervention and food and mood. Uh, nutrition literacy, so easy to understand food labeling guides. We have some great webinars on that happening as well. These are all essential for our mental health and our mental well-being. Um, so now we're going to run through some of the research associated with nutrition and mental health. So first, we'll talk a bit about nutrition and stress. So cortisol, you may be familiar uh, with that word. So this is an important steroid hormone that is secreted in response to stress and can affect your mental health mood and mood stability in particular. So cortisol secretion levels may be affected by negative mood states, fatigue, or a burnout from acute or chronic stress. So this is, this is what gets released when we're under stress. So um, maybe you're sitting in traffic. Uh, and that's agitating to you. Cortisol is going to be secreted in that, in, that in, in that instance. Sorry. So there's psychological factors that's associated with your food intake, uh, such as intentional diet restraint. This can alter your cortisol secretion and your mental function. So if you're choosing to maybe fast, um, you're on a restrictive diet, this can actually increase your cortisol levels uh, for your stress response. Energy, uh, energy metabolism and glucose. So um, glucose, of course, is our preferred source of fuel for the brain. So glucose is when you consume a carbohydrate, your body will turn the sugars from that carbohydrate into glucose, which is a form of a sugar. So this is the preferred source of fuel for our brain, and it's the most easily converted into energy. So it's the brain prefers, of course, the body prefers anything that's going to make uh, less effort, less work. So as soon as we start consuming carbohydrates, our body's going to turn it into glucose, which can then immediately go through the, through the blood vessels and all that great stuff uh, up into the brain. So this helps with the brain functions such as thinking, uh, memory, and learning. Uh, they are closely linked to glucose levels and how efficiently the brain uses this fuel source. So if you think about in the morning, um, maybe you went to work, you were in a bit of a rush, you skipped out on breakfast that morning. Has anyone ever felt like you couldn't be as productive because you haven't had breakfast or a piece of fruit or, or whatever it may be that you need to have to get your brain up and running? Yeah, I'm the same way. I, 
I usually eat breakfast a little bit later in the morning, just out of a habit. Um, but I'm starting to recognize now that you're recognizing kind of different things while we're stuck here at home, that I'm definitely way more productive if I have a good, um, a good source of breakfast in the morning uh, before I get started with my work. So if we talk a little bit about other types of nutrients that I never want to talk to anyone until after I eat. Yep, that's fair. Absolutely. Um, and there is still a lot of people who, who don't eat breakfast. Uh, you're right. And, and everyone's a little bit different. We're not all the same. But I know for myself and many others that breakfast really is um, as cliche as this is the most important meal of the day, at least, at least for me to get going. So often when we talk about um, uh, carbohydrates and how they're the best source of fuel for the brain, we often now go into topics about other sources of energy for the brain, just because um, a ketogenic diet is a big thing that's on the go right now. Uh, maybe Atkins or all of these ones that kind of lower the amount of carbohydrates um, and more so promote high protein or high fat. So I just want to talk a little bit about, again, why glucose is the most important source or the preferred fuel. But then also for anyone who is following a different form of diet, uh, how your body turns these other nutrients into fuel for the brain. So glucose or carbohydrates can immediately be turned into glucose uh, directly into energy, but the body can't do that with protein and fats. So the body first has to convert uh, protein and fat into a different form of usable form before they can be burned to provide energy. So if you haven't eaten for a long period of time or you have not eaten any carbohydrates, then the body will turn to a secondary source of fuel such as fat. So fat would be the next thing that the body's gonna turn to if you're not consuming carbohydrates, which turns into glucose. So when we're not eating, we're gonna use fats for energy because we have fat stored in our body. Um, which, so kind of the way that it works, I'll, I'll make it into a bit of easier terms. But when we're not eating, we use fats for energy to fuel the body. But when we don't have glucose, the fats don't burn completely, which creates ketones. So we may be familiar with that term, ketones. So ketones, so it's kind of like a, a starvation mode. So your, your liver produces these ketones, and this is what can then go through the blood and up to the brain uh, to provide fuel. But if we think about how much more complex that is than just consuming carbohydrates, which immediately turns to glucose, it's a bit harder on the body and takes a bit more time to do. So again, really showing the importance of, of why carbohydrates are a good part of your, of your diet. So next, antioxidant effects. So are we all familiar with the term antioxidants? So really, antioxidants are, are in all kinds of really great uh, minerals, uh, vitamins, polyphenols. Um, some herbal extracts. So antioxidants help protect our DNA um, from oxidation, so from, or oxidative stress. So from stress on the body, from uh, pollution, um, smoking, all this kind of stuff. So antioxidants help protect our body really from that. So several substances and things that we consume um, really increases our antioxidant levels in our body, which helps with the effects. So research is showing that oxidative stress mechanisms appear to be a common thread in mood disorders. So um, if you are undergoing quite a bit of oxidative stress, this can really take a turn on, on your mental health and your mood. So we'll dive in a little bit more now on um, different nutrients and what functions they provide for the brain. So aside from glucose, which we talk quite a bit about, there's other nutrients that provide function for your brain health. Uh, so we'll go through a few of them now. So we have our three macronutrients, which are our carbohydrates, our fat, and our protein. So our carbohydrates, again, like we talked about, is our main source of fuel for the brain. When you consume carbohydrates, your body releases insulin, which helps your blood glucose enter the cells. So as soon as you eat, insulin is going to be released, 
and this is going to help move everything up to your brain. So as insulin levels rise, this affects the levels of neurotransmitters such as serotonin. So if we're, we're having, I don't know, a piece of whole grain toast, uh, insulin's going to be released because we're consuming carbohydrates, which is sugar, um, and this is going to increase our serotonin levels. And we may be familiar with the word serotonin as being the happy chemical. So this is a type of hormone that contributes to your well-being and happiness. So if we move over to fat, so our healthy fats, so our unsaturated fats, we may be familiar with monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, um, one of which is omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, so you can get omega-3 from uh, fatty fish sources. Uh, like your salmon, herring, mackerel, sardines, uh, tuna. Omega-3 has a really important role on better brain function, uh, specifically with memory and mood. So making sure that you're consuming some type of um, fatty fish once or twice a week. Um, also, nuts and seeds have a good amount of omega-3s in them as well. So if a few days a week you're having a, a good handful of some type of uh, fatty nut like an almond or, or walnut or anything along those lines that'll help contribute to your omega-3 intake. And then finally protein. So protein is made up of many amino acids. So amino acids, there's 20, 21 types of them um, that we can consume and that are within our body and they connect to make up proteins. So some proteins have a bunch of different amino acids, some just have a few amino acids. Um, and these are known, amino acids are known as precursors for neurotransmitters, which means that consuming your protein foods in your diet um, can influence the uptake of amino acids in the brain and can directly modify their conversion to neurotransmitters, which can release serotonin, like we talked about was the, the happy chemical, and dopamine, which provides us with pleasure. Can your body produce the fatty acids themselves? Uh, no, so um, we have, they're called essential fatty acids. And when, when it's called an essential fatty acid or an essential amino acid, it means that we have to consume it through diet. Um, we can store these in our bodies as well. They will get uh, stored in, in different, um, in like our liver or, or wherever these different mechanisms and everything gets stored. Um, but mostly you just want to consume enough of it um, throughout the week to be able to help your body function. So vitamins. So our B vitamins um, are really important for our, uh, for our brain health and for our mood. Um, so vitamin B6, I just, I just chose kind of the most, uh, the four, there's tons of vitamins, but I just chose the four most important ones that I wanted to discuss today. So vitamin B6 um, has a role in synthesis of many neurotransmitters. So meaning again, uh, that vitamin B6 contributes to those positive neurotransmitters like your serotonin and your dopamine. Deficiency in vitamin B6 can actually reduce the production of these uh, of these hormones. So we really wanna make sure that we have enough B6 in our diet. Um, next, we have pantothenic acid. So this actually converts our macronutrients into energy. So macronutrients being our carbs, our fat, and our protein, this, ac this pantothenic acid helps to convert these into energy, which is super important. It's also required for production of red blood cells and hormones and uh, required for uptake of amino acids, so those protein building blocks. This is important to make sure that these amino acids make its way through your body and up to your brain. And it's also necessary uh, to make vitamin D, uh, necessary to make vitamin D and it works closely with the B vitamins. So all the vitamins have their own uh, part in the body and they all work with one another to be able to, to help with all the functions. Okay, I see a few questions. So we're gonna talk about, so I can, I can go into this now. So really, um, you can get your vitamins and minerals um, from a vast array. So if you, have a, if you follow Canada's Food Guide, or if you make sure that you're consuming adequate amounts of protein, uh, fat, 
and carbs and of course your, your vegetables and your fruit, you're going to get all of the vitamins that you need. So uh, if you eat um, a variety of fruits and vegetables, these will provide you with the vitamins and minerals that you need um, that are specific to this. So vitamin A um, is, it influences the hormone pathways, which are known to cause mood elevation and depression. And then vitamin E protects your cells from damage by free radicals. At what point should we use supplements? So actually, if you have a balanced diet, so if you're, say for instance, you're vegetarian or vegan, um, that is a time when you may want to speak to um, a dietitian or your physician uh, about adding supplements into your diet because there's some vitamins and minerals that you can't get, that you can only get through meat. So for instance, vitamin B12, you can only get through meat sources. So if this is the case, um, if you don't eat meat, then it's really important in that, in that case to make sure that you're taking a B12 supplement. Aside from that, if you consume, um, if you consume adequate meat and, and fruits and vegetables and you have an overall balanced diet, you, there's no need to use any supplements unless you have any type of underlying health condition, um, which might reduce the absorption rate, in which case you can, um, you can talk to your dietitian at home or your physician about what supplements might be best for you. But aside from that, kind of the, the overall point is that if you are able to consume a balanced diet, you will get all of the vitamins and minerals that you need. Vitamin B6 for energy boost, is that true? Quite possibly. I mean, um, manufacturers of any kind, especially with energy drinks, I'm going to be talking about that actually uh, two weeks from today. I'll talk a bit more about energy drinks. Um, I'm not super familiar with um, the energy boost uh, that they might be referring to with vitamin B6, but it's quite possible if we think about, if we read what we have here with how uh, it really helps boost up your um, your serotonin and your dopamine and your other happy uh, hormones. Then it's quite likely because you know when you when something exciting is happening in your life, this is uh, releasing the serotonin and the dopamine. Uh, so it's quite possible that where vitamin B six is so related to this pathway that it can be considered an energy boost. So how does food affect your mood? So if we switch the thoughts from um, your brain to now focusing on your gut. So some of us might now be familiar with that, familiar with the research that points to how um, your gut is so, so, is very much associated with your brain and your mood health. I have blood work done to check vitamin deficiencies. Yes, absolutely. So that's something that you can ask your doctor to get or your uh, uh, your dietitian can't, can't take that requisition for you, but um, your doctor or if you go to a naturopath, uh, they can do blood work to check on your vitamin deficiencies, uh, which is really interesting because a lot of the things that we might have, um, maybe we get headaches or we might have uh, dry skin or all of these different things, they can actually really be associated with low vitamin, um, low vitamins. So it, it's a really great thing to know kind of where you might be low and what foods you can implement to be, to be able to, to increase those. So the human microbiome, so your gut environment, is a community that's filled with a bunch of different bacteria that's beneficial for a person and the bacteria. So our stomachs and our and our intestines and all this stuff has all kinds of really great bacteria in it that's super important for our health so when we eat especially foods that contain chemical additives and ultra processed foods uh, so our our baked goods or our fast food um, these affect our gut environment in a negative way so ultra processed foods contain substances that are extracted from foods. So um, they're gonna have higher sugar and higher starch. Um, they might have hydrogenated, hydrogenated fats added in them. Uh, some of the things in ultra processed foods uh, may actually be made in the laboratory like flavor enhancers and food coloring. 
So if we think about when we're consuming fast food, which, you know, sometimes when we're on the go, it's something that we need to, we need to grab because we haven't had anything to eat yet. And that's perfectly fine um, within a balanced diet to have these treats in this fast food every now and again. Um, it's just, if we're consuming it all the time, it's really gonna affect um, not only our brain health, but it's gonna increase the likelihood for disease uh, and all of that other stuff. So fast food is manufactured um, to be extra tasty by using these different ingredients and additives. So um, every, even the food marketing, like you drive by McDonald's, the golden arch, you're immediately craving something that you enjoy consuming at McDonald's. So that even affects our mood in itself. So types of product of processed foods that we might consume may be um, soda, uh, sugary or savory packaged snack foods, so candies or, or chips, uh, packaged breads, buns, and pastries, uh, fish, fish or chicken nuggets, and then instant noodle soups. So these are all ultra-processed ultra foods. So what's the connection between our gut and our mood? So we talked about serotonin being the happy chemical, or the, the happy hormone, um, and actually 90% of the receptors for serotonin live in your gut. So when the balance between your good and bad bacteria is disrupted, it can truly affect our mood. Any good book author to recommend on brain and gut? Not that I'm aware of, but I can um, do some research on that this morning, and then I can... Um, find a way to send it out to everyone that was in this. If everyone's interested, um, I can send out a, a recommendation or even some, some research papers and stuff along this line. I'll make note of that. Perfect. Oh, I'm not familiar with, with that author. I'll look that up. Perfect, wonderful, thanks so much. So now if we think about the last time you ate too many high sugary foods, so candies or fast food, how did it make you feel? If anyone's willing to, to share. Satisfied, tired, sluggish, yeah, so happy jittery high for a while so that's a good point so um, that's exactly what I want to get into is these different feelings that we have when we consume something uh, as yummy as this cupcake uh, that's on the screen in front of us so when we consume something that's ultra processed um, what happens is that we yeah we become energized for for a short time so um, we consume it and it has what's called uh, fast digesting carbohydrates so it quickly gives us a whole bunch of energy. So we get this sugar high, and then we get to this peak where we're in a really great place, and then suddenly it just crashes. So this is what we know as like a, a sugar high and a sugar crash or a burnout. So yeah, so we might, um, we might feel really great about it at first and feel super good, and then suddenly we're sluggish and, and tired. So this is why we wanna consume less of the ultra, ultra processed foods and consume more of the foods that we're going to talk about in the next couple slides. So complex carbohydrates. So we might be familiar with the terms complex and simple carbohydrates. Both complex and simple, they are both sugar. Um, sugar is sugar, no matter what source you get it from. But complex and simple are different in the sense that Complex is made up of these longer chains of sugar molecules, um, whereas simple is just a couple or just one. So when you have longer chains of these sugar molecules in your complex carbohydrates, it takes the body longer to break these down, which, which provides more lasting energy in the body than a simple carbohydrate. So for instance, if you were to consume a piece of just plain refined white bread in the morning for breakfast, um, might be a good trial to, to test out if you have some at home. Um, have a couple slices of that in the morning, 
see how it makes you feel, uh, whether or not you get that big spike of energy and then that crash. And then another day, try consuming something that's more complex, so a whole grain form of bread. And see how rather than a sharp uh, increase and sharp decline, uh, you're going to have more of a bell curve. So you'll get a slower amount of energy that'll stable out, and then that energy will decrease uh, quite slowly as well. So you won't get that crash. So that's why we want to encourage you to consume more of a complex carbohydrate. So examples, of course, of a complex carbohydrate would be uh, whole grain bread, um, whole grain cereal, um, potatoes, so things that are high in fiber, potatoes, beans, uh, peas, oatmeal, anything that's really hearty. So when you're looking at food labels, um, really important to make sure that whatever you're purchasing uh, has a good amount of fiber in it. So anything that really has um, five grams of fiber per serving is wonderful. Uh, three is okay too when it comes to fiber, but really five or more is what we really want to aim for because uh, this is going to indicate that it's a complex carbohydrate and it's going to take longer for your body to to digest that and to release the energy. So protein. So like we talked about in the earlier slides, protein is made up of amino acids that assist with the neurotransmitters to help with the release of serotonin and dopamine. So those really good hormones that make us feel good. So therefore, when we consume protein, it really highly assists with the positive mood. So your protein sources can be um, your lean meat, your fish, poultry, dairy, eggs, uh, beans, and nuts. So if there's anyone here who um, is vegetarian or vegan, you can get really great protein sources as well by not consuming animal protein, um, by, but by consuming legumes and legumes, sorry, um, and nuts and seeds and, and all that kind of great stuff you can incorporate in that. Uh, and soy products and all that stuff are going to give you a, a good amount of protein as well, which will help with your, your mood um, and your brain health. And then fat. So like we talked about with unsaturated fats, so these are known as our good fats. So there's different types of fats. We have unsaturated, uh, saturated, and trans. Um, but we want to always focus on the on the unsaturated. So these would be our good fats, which are super great for your brain health and mood. Again, like your omega-3 fatty acids. So you can find these really great fats um, in, in your seeds and your nuts and fatty fish and your oil. So using um, olive oil or even canola oil or sunflower oil or avocado oil. Incorporating these oils uh, into your meals is going to really help with your your fat intake, um, help with flavor, uh, keep you full for longer, um, and again, most importantly in context to this presentation, is, uh, is helping with your brain health. Thoughts on coconut oil. So coconut oil was kind of um, on a really high pedestal there for a few years ago. Um, just saying that you can use it for just about everything. The thing is with coconut oil is it is considered a saturated fat. Um, which can be really hard on our, our heart health and, and other forms of health as well. So we want to lower the amount of saturated fat that we're having. Coconut oil kind of has its, its time and place. Some people really enjoy the flavor. If you're making a stir fry, throwing in coconut oil to give it kind of that nice uh, coconut flavor, perfectly fine within moderation. Um, but again, the research is now showing, you know what, maybe coconut oil isn't so great after all where it is, uh, saturated fat, and to more so focus on those unsaturated fats like your olive oil. No problem. So vitamins again, so your B vitamins, your B6, your B12, uh, your folate, these all play a really important role in improving memory and concentration, and it also really helps with your sleep schedule. So all of these vitamins can be found in a variety of different items, um, like your fortified cereals. So if you look on, on your cereal boxes that you might have at home, you'll see that, they, that some of them are fortified with vitamins and minerals. Uh, soy products are fortified with them as well. And then of course your potatoes, legumes such as chickpeas, uh, fish and shellfish, dairy, dark green vegetables, and whole grain foods. So again, really reiterating that if you consume a fully balanced diet, um, 
with a, a vast array of, of different types of food each day, um, then you're then you're going to get all of the the nutrients that you need. Is fortified better or natural? Um, there's no real difference. That's a really great question. There's no real difference. Um, a lot of food is fortified uh, from sent from decades ago just because it was noticed in the population um, that there was different deficiencies happening. So that's when they made the decision to fortify uh, different foods that are consumed quite often um, to be able to provide us with the nutrients that we need. So it's not um, considered better or worse. It's more so uh, a really wonderful way um, to be able to get those nutrients that you may be deficient in. So there's, there's nothing wrong with consuming anything that's, that's fortified. <laughs> Cutting carbs like the keto diet. So um, different diets help everyone a little bit differently. So some people may may um, may feel really great just working on a balanced diet like Canada's Food Guide. Some people may not handle carbs as as well as others. So that's why they choose to to do ketogenic or to go more higher fat uh, than carbs. Um, I like to say that. Um, based on brain health and, and other body functions that your diet should mainly consume, the highest amount should consume, uh, that the highest amount should be your carbohydrates followed by your protein intake followed by your fat. So um, I'm one to say that carbohydrates are super important for body functions and for brain health as well. Um, but some people honestly do find and attest to saying that consuming carbs makes them feel sluggish and they, they function much better uh, on fats. Um, the keto diet, one thing that you want to really make sure of is that really be, being sure that you're consuming a lot of unsaturated fats versus saturated. So um, when I was a dietitian practicing in uh, private practice, I had a few clients that wanted to follow the keto diet. Um, and their diets, a lot of them sadly would consume of, of I don't know, bacon wrapped cream cheese and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, that isn't super great for our health uh, in its own self, but if it's something that you're consuming every day, it's definitely going to be detrimental. Uh, so if you do choose to follow a keto diet, making sure that you're you're really doing your research and getting the help along the way from a dietitian um, to be able to make sure that you're making the right sources. But again, really, it just depends on on how it's making you feel. Carbs found in vegetables such as squash. So yeah. So um, oh, you're welcome, John. So. Um, the carbs that are found in vegetables um, are also a really great source of, of carbohydrates. So um, your whole, if you think about the carbs found in whole grains, you're getting high fiber, which is super great for digestive and heart health. Same goes for vegetables like squash as well. So um, squash or peas or potatoes or sweet potatoes or carrots or anything really that's grown in the ground is going to provide you with carbohydrates. It's also going to provide you with a lot of other nutrients as well. So there's all kinds of different great vitamins and minerals available in squash when you consume that as well. So I wouldn't ever limit the amount um, or eliminate rather uh, the carbohydrate based vegetables like our root or ground vegetables. Um, but just being aware to kind of focus um, also on those green leafy vegetables because they also contain super great nutrients as well. Okay, so everyone familiar with this term? Hangry? Who here has been hangry? Yep. My husband's over there doing work on the couch and just raised his hand. I can attest to that. He does get hangry, as do I. Yep. Yeah, no one likes to be, my wife, yep, no one likes to be hangry or to be around uh, someone who's hangry. So our brain is actually in charge of our hunger. So when we're hungry, it's our brains that are on the lookout for energy, energy rich foods. So they're kind of in control. So keep in mind though that our brains are also hardwired to avoid running out of energy. So our brains are always in this thought that what happens if we can't get our next meal? Um, what happens if we go into starvation mode? Um, so it's constantly looking for food, um, which can sometimes be challenging to turn off. So being aware of those senses that your brain provides you um, of hunger when you may not actually even be hungry at all. 
which food gives us the best energy boost? So, so I would say, so Snickers, like the bars. <laughs> so I would say the foods that give you the best energy boost would be those, um, those that are, are, I don't know, I guess everything can really give you a good energy boost. Um, as long as it's uh, complex, like a complex carbohydrate. So, um, so your your breads and all that stuff best energy boost in respect now to um to exercise if you want a good boost of energy for for exercise physical activity then a simple carbohydrate works best for that so a piece of fruit um a smoothie um white refined bread uh, that's going to give you a good energy boost but it might also give you a crash as well so pairing that with something else so if you have an apple uh, as a snack to give you energy, maybe putting um, peanut butter on it will help to slow down the rate that it's digested and will give you an energy boost without that crash. Does the combination of different foods together in a meal have a benefit in your body, the chemistry of combinations? Yeah, so there is actually different forms of combinations. Um, I don't know a whole lot off the top of my head, but I do know that um, if you're consuming, say, iron rich foods, so you're having like a, a nice cut of steak, um, it's really great to pair that with a, a form of vitamin C. Uh, that will help with the absorption and the digestion of iron. So there's different really great combinations of foods um, to benefit your body. Again, also another example that I can say is those who consume um, other plant based protein sources like. Uh, legumes and lentils and, and all of that stuff. When you pair those together, uh, you want to make sure that you're pairing different types of, of protein sources together in that sense uh, to be able to give it its most benefit. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's great, Brandy. Thanks for pointing out. Um, if you look, uh, if you know um, anyone who's an Ironman, that's really great. Good for you. Um, Ironman or, or does marathons or anything, you'll often see little stations set up or they may pull out from their pocket, um, even just simple gummy bears or, or something with sugar, some simple type of carbohydrate that's going to boost up your energy. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for pointing that out. So how to avoid getting hangry. So again, um, if someone in your life, like your husband or your wife or your children, um, get hangry, this is going to be recorded and you can show them this part of the presentation. So um, to avoid getting hangry, we want to make sure that we're not skipping any meals. So um, if you haven't had breakfast yet, um, maybe planning to have breakfast right after we finish this webinar. Uh, eating cons consistent meals and snacks. So I like to say that you should have your breakfast, a snack, lunch, a snack, supper and then maybe a snack if you feel like you need something before you go to bed. But again, uh, something like an apple and peanut butter, something that's not too hearty uh, on the body. Drinking fluids. So of course, drinking fluids, uh, mostly uh, drinking water is, is kind of our goal in this when we say drink fluids. Uh, eating more whole grains and fewer refined sugars. Uh, incorporating protein at every meal, so um, whether that's uh, milk or yogurt uh, for breakfast, uh, for lunch having uh, leftovers from the night before like uh, like chicken or legumes or whatever you had, uh, and then at supper again having that protein in there as well. And then of course exercising regularly can also uh, help you avoid from getting hangry. Cooking a meat in a steel pan, yeah absolutely, so a, a cast iron pan um, can actually really help the the food that you're cooking on an iron um, on an iron pan actually absorbs into the food, uh, which helps with your iron intake. That's great. Thanks for thanks for pointing that out. So I wanted to touch just really briefly. This is the the last slide here, and then I'll I'll let everyone go. Um, stress and eating. So of course, this pandemic that's been ongoing for however many weeks now. I'm sure we've all lost track. Um, has really affected and, and likely affected a lot of our stress levels. Um, maybe we know that it's affecting it, maybe we don't, um, but it likely, unfortunately, is because it's, it's thrown quite the wrench in our, in, our usually, in our usual routines. So when we're under stress, it's associated with an altered eating behavior pattern, so also known as emotional or stress eating. So these emotionally-based changes in our eating can either be overeating, 
binge eating or under eating, like uh, severely uh, restricting your caloric intake. So these are just uh, five tips that I wanted to quickly go through uh, that's going to speak to um, how to control um, and how to take charge of your stress eating. So one, you want to become more aware of your feelings and let yourself feel these away from the food. So what this means is taking the time each day uh, to reflect on how you feel and whether it's leading you to crave food in an undesirable way. So asking yourself questions like, how are you feeling? When do you feel most stressed? What is the most worrisome to you about your life today? So thinking about how you're feeling and how you're associating that and how you're helping yourself feel better. Number two is recognizing your triggers for emotionally based eating. So really becoming clear about what you will be most likely to want to eat more or less. So triggers can also be internal. So you might think about how hard it is to work from home. Maybe you're arguing with your, with your partner or your loved ones uh, about the financial stress that you may be going through. Um, so asking yourself, when are you most likely to stress eat and what kinds of foods do you crave and why? Making a conscious choice about your eating and avoiding triggers when possible. So choosing deliberately what you will eat and when. So uh, this all comes back to kind of meal planning. So taking the time uh, on the weekend or some day where you have some time to really plan out what you're going to eat throughout the week so that you won't be triggered um, to make decisions on food that might be fast, like fast food. Uh, getting social support while avoiding exposure to triggering materials. So social support's challenging, of course, right now, but making sure that you're still connecting um, if you're feeling stressed, maybe uh, FaceTiming family or friends to be able to kind of use the talking and chatting as a coping mechanism uh, rather than some, some sort of food. And then starting fresh each day. So um, we're all going to have rough moments. We're all going to consume food that we may not uh, that we may not eat very often. And understanding that you can always start eating differently at this exact moment. So uh, don't dwell in things that you may have consumed or, or feel like um, you've ruined what you've already accomplished. Know that you can always start over, um, and that's perfectly fine. So these are available resources. Uh, that you can reach out to during this time uh, if you're feeling stressed or under pressure. Um, these are all uh, really great resources for CAF members, families, and others as well. And the last thing that I really want to point out is there's so many changes and adjustments uh, happening since COVID-19 came to play. Um, don't be hard on yourself um, and try to change too many habits. So don't set these expectations like, I'm going to exercise every day because now I work from home. It's a great plan if you're able to do it, but don't put yourself under too much pressure because there's so much going on in the world right now that there's so many things that we may be stressed about um, without consciously being aware of it. And putting ourselves under this pressure is, is not really great for anyone. So... Enjoy the food that you're consuming. If you want a treat like the, like a donut, have it all within moderation. It's all, it's all about balance and making sure that you're keeping yourself happy and healthy. So thank you so much, and I hope everyone has a wonderful uh, long weekend. And for those of you who uh, are looking for specific resources, I'm going to take some time now uh, to go through those, and uh, I'll find a way to send them to all the participants. All right, thanks so much.